So I'm an engineer. I'm not a human resources person. I'm not a public affairs officer. I am a good old engineer. <laughs> and I'm here to represent NASA. My background is mechanical engineering, and I've worked at the Johnson Space Center for 17 and a half years. Woohoo! I'm a teenager. <laughs> now, I know what you're all thinking right now is I started when I was four, and if that's what you thought, I greatly appreciate it. A lady never reveals her age, but I did start when I was 19, and to quote my mother, I can't believe NASA is hiring 19 year olds to send hardware into space and keep our astronauts alive. And I said, well, Mom, we are special 19 year olds, aren't we? <laughs> So a little bit of background about Johnson Space Center, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, we are a family of just over 3,000 civil servants and about 10,000 contractors. We have a facility uh, just down south on 45 at the Johnson Space Center. That's our primary campus. We have a sister campus at the White Sands Test Facility in New Mexico. We also have Ellington Field, where if you've ever been to the, sorry for the huge advertisement, but the Wings Over Houston Air Show, I'm a complete airplane geek, and I love that every October, but uh, we host that out of, out of Ellington Field. But that's also where we fly our T-38s, our trainer aircraft for our astronauts to fly. Our um, other aircraft, including the Vomit Comet, which is one of my favorite things to get to do as an engineer. I have not given it its namesake, though I can probably say. So um, that's a little bit about Johnson Space Center. Also, don't forget we have a very big swimming pool that none of us can swim in unless you're an astronaut, an engineer, or a scuba diver but it's the Sunny Carter Training Facility, and it is a very large facility where we sync uh, modules of our International Space Station, but we also are working now very closely with our commercial partners and our, our local industry to do um, certain training aspects of underwater drilling and welding, so it's a great facility that shows one of the fantastic partnerships that we have with local industry. Well, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, we retired the space shuttle. Are you all aware of that? Yes, okay. So how many of you hands in the air thought that was it, NASA is going down, no more space stuff? Anyone? Yes, I get it from kids all the time. In fact, right after we retired the space shuttle, our public affairs office was very busy with phone calls asking what are all of your employees going to do now that you've retired the shuttle and you're closing down the space program? And we all said, well, you know we have people still living there. <laughs> So we are still definitely in business, and we have a lot of exciting things happening right now to continue our development, not only on the International Space Station, but for future exploration. So let's talk about that space station for a minute. I just have to ask, how many of you are aware that we have human beings in space right now? Oh, thank goodness. Okay, very good. Well, you know, I was on an airplane not too long ago, and I sat next to a very nice gentleman who had no idea. And then I took it upon myself to spend that next hour and a half <laughs> educating the poor gentleman. And I'm pretty sure at the end of the flight, he said, OK, I'm getting off this plane. So um, we do have an International Space Station flying. We can go to the next slide. And uh, it's been continuously supported with human life since November of 2001. This is one of the most significant achievements, I think, that we have done for the United States and for the world. Every piece of hardware that is flying in space was built by human hands, robotic elements, and it wasn't put together as the big giant jigsaw puzzle until it was in space. This is one of the proudest achievements I have as a NASA engineer, to represent our aerospace industry. Not only have we had humans living on board, but we now have um, one of our robonauts, our robotic assistants up there to help us out. And this is a huge international effort of 16 international international countries, so it is very much a global facility. It's also been deemed a national research laboratory where we also have students that fly experiments. One of my favorite experiments was to fly spiders in space to see how they would change their leaf patterns for their webs. We just brought those two uh, spiders back down, so it was a very successful student program that we flew. So if you have any young scientists that are interested in flying their experiments at a nice airspeed of 17,500 miles per hour, um, please encourage them to look on the NASA.gov website. We have a lot of opportunities. Let's go on to the next thing. Because not only do we have humans in space, we're going to continue flying them until at least 2020, so a lot more years ahead of us. But we are looking to develop vehicles and exploration programs that are going to take us beyond low Earth orbit where we're flying right now. We have the Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle that is under development at the Johnson Space Center. How exciting. 
We're developing it, we're testing it across our NASA facilities, and it is a vehicle that is gonna look very similar to what we did in the Apollo era with the Saturn V vehicle, but thank goodness, with years of development and technological advancements, it's gonna be a pretty awesome thing. And so we're developing that right now. We've been doing um, drop tests out in Yuma over the last several years, but next year, you have got to stay tuned because we are doing our first engineering flight test of the Orion vehicle. This isn't years and years away. Next year is our first engineering flight test. And then we're gonna start sending people up. Well, we're gonna do our first flight with crew in 2021. Now to your kids, that might sound a long time from now, but guess what? Right about when they're getting out of school and grad school and trying to get jobs, we're gonna need a lot of help. So we've got a lot of things going here. How many of you have ever thought about going to the moon or Mars? I'm just curious. Good, okay. Well, how many of you have someone you've thought about sending to the moon or Mars? <laughs> yes, okay, that's more likely. Well, it's not that far away. <laughs> So pretty soon we might all be able to send someone or hopefully buy a ticket. And in fact, it's even closer if you think about the fact that we've now partnered with commercial industry. So we have cargo vehicles that are under, de under development right now for crew resupply on the International Space Station. And we've had several successful uh, dockings with the International Space Station. And more recently, now we've gone under contract with these same uh, commercial leaders to start developing our crew aircraft. So if you've ever thought about flying in space, save your pennies and your dollars and maybe $100 bills, because um, it's not going to be that affordable just yet. But it is starting to become something that is a tangible, tangible part of our future. Okay, let's go on to our next slide and talk about what our NASA administrator opened up to the community not so long ago about our FY14 budget. Well, if you've watched some of those Hollywood movies about going out and doing exploration on an asteroid, this is something that NASA has been looking at for some time. And one of our next missions that we are really looking at very closely is not only going out and exploring an asteroid, but in the way, t in the way we do things Texas style, lassoing it and bringing it a bit closer to Earth. So this is something to stay tuned in with your students, with your families, with your friends, with your neighbors. This is something we've never done before and I'm so excited to see how well we progress with this new strategy of exploration. And finally, to hit really the topic of today, NASA is devoted and really looking at advancing high quality education. There are so many opportunities out there for your students to get involved with, whether you're a parent or a teacher. No matter what grade level you are, even as an adult, please, I highly encourage you to get on the nasa.gov website and see what contributions you can make to this industry. In fact, let's go ahead and go to that next slide. And I, I have to say, I know we've got an eye chart here. We've talked about the stats. I even looked at these stats today once again and thought, oh my gosh, we have to make some changes. The point I wanna make on this slide is that bottom bullet, that more than half or 57% of STEM college students say that before going to college, a teacher or class got them interested in STEM. I'm one of those students. Now, I always grew up wanting to be an astronaut and wanting to work for NASA, but my family environment and my school environment was very much more liberal arts. I do not come from a technical family. I grew up dancing. My mother was a dance teacher, so when I was a baby, before I could walk, I was dancing. I grew up with Broadway right down, down a few train stops away. I grew up on Long Island. And I wanna point out to all of you that while we're talking about STEM today and the importance of it, you don't have to be a STEM person to inspire kids to love science and technology, engineering and math. Some of the teachers that inspired me most were not my science teachers. I do have an eighth grade science teacher that I keep in touch with now, who has been a huge inspiration to me. But when I think about the teachers that really pushed me, one individual was my dance teacher. My dance teacher in high school, I went to a performing arts school. And my dance teacher taught us day in and day out. Wow, he made us learn those dance steps until we were sleeping and doing them in our dreams. But what I took was that theory, that lesson of practice and implement, practice and implement, and I brought it across to some of those science classes that I was not good at. Boy, I do a lot of chemistry at work, but I have to share a secret that I was not good in chemistry in school. But you know, a funny thing is that I ended up doing a lot of chemistry with my mechanical engineering degree. So 
STEM is something that we can all inspire. Not, you don't have to be pre preordained in that way. We were talking about math teachers saying they don't have the math gene. You don't need the math gene. Just know that math is important, sci science is important, and that we're all mathematicians and scientists in some way. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And I just want to point out that red arrow is where the United States falls on a math, on a uh, math and science study. Let's fix that, shall we? <laughs> okay, a few closing things. There are a variety of NASA resources that are available to you. First of all, that nasa.gov website, you could lose yourself for days. There is a tab there for students and a tab for educators. Check it out. Seriously, there's so much going on. If you're in this community and you see, we've got dif different outcomes that we're looking at for informal education, formal education, and higher education. If you're interested in learning about some of that, definitely, once again, go to that nasa.gov website. And what I want to close with are a few things. Um, NASA Johnson Space Center, we're, we're the home of human spaceflight, and we're so excited to be a part of this panel today. We have partnerships with the chemical industry, partnerships with commercial en entities, partnerships with NGOs, and obviously partnerships with the de Department of Education. We're still in business. We have a lot of work to do, and it's going to take a global community to get these exploration efforts to go beyond low Earth orbit underway. So it's, it's on all of us to really make this happen, not just for our students, but for our planet Earth. Everything that we do at NASA benefits here on Earth. If you have a cell phone, if you watch the traffic or the weather on the news today, you know that we have things in space that are benefiting us here on Earth, not just the astronauts that are flying. And I want to invite all of you to become a part of our family of space explorers, to challenge the people that you work with and the students and, and your children that you work with, challenge them to become a part of this family. And of course, I couldn't close today without giving all of you a little homework. <laughs> this is an education panel, right? Well, homework is key, okay. Well, you know, we've all talked about how our industry partners and, and our, um, our corporations are working on pushing students to break the barriers of STEM, but I wanna know not only what we can do, but what can you do? And he talked about something you can take to the classroom or take to your families as of tonight or to, on Monday. I want to challenge you to think about what you can do. We're here to support. We're here to represent the organizations that are doing this effort. But every single one of us has to make that effort. So I want to challenge you. That's your homework. Think about it. I will know if you don't do your homework, OK? We have people up there looking down on Earth right now. So I will know. And I want to thank you all once again for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Thank you.